Lifestyle Pirates with Big J and Adriano. Okay, morning guys. Welcome to Lifestyle Pirates. We are here with Greg Burley, who is the sommelier at Bisteca, and the Gidley here in Sydney. Morning, mate. How are you? Oh, I'm very well. How are you? We're good. Very We're well, good. thanks. Um, so you bought a double shift yesterday. Yeah, interesting one, you know, uh, a good sort of 13-hour Friday. 13 wow. hours on your feet? On your feet. Yep. Jesus. But, you know, that's... That's what we do. It, <laughs> it keeps you awake, keeps you fit. Absolutely. I can imagine you're getting the 10,000 steps in. Oh, easy. Easy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quiet day. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, mate, what, what's the vibe like at the moment, you know, in, um, in the restaurants, in the, in, in the CBD? What's, what's going on? Look, it's, it's all very uncertain. I'm sure it is for people everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had a fantastic June when things first reopened. People yep. were dead keen to get out there and spend and, and have a good time and, you know, just get out of the house. Mm. That's definitely dropped off and I think in particular since Melbourne ran into trouble, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people in Sydney are struggling, particularly in the city, you know. I'd say more than half of people are still working from home, particularly um, people in in the law. Mm. Uh, That whole area of town around the law courts is still very quiet. So it's a bit of a struggle. People are still going out uh, but they're not spending like they were. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I actually like the fact you guys have now you can book for for small groups as well as you know, tables well, for two and all that. Um, I kind of like the way that restaurant situation is now playing out, where yeah. you know it's a, it's a pay to play. You know, there's a, a commitment if you book, you, you yeah. take a deposit or a pre auth. Mm. I, I hope that sticks around because look, I think it's going to have to because mm. I mean it certainly changed the atmosphere in our restaurants, particularly at Bisteca. Uh, you weren't able to book for fewer than six people, for example. Yep. Um, and now we've had a lot of people who've been able to come through the last couple of months that weren't able to get a table before. So yeah. family groups of three and four coming in for a special occasion. Yep. Uh, and that's certainly changed the vibe. It's introduced us to a new clientele as well, yep. uh, which has been really fun. You know, yep. it's not just the normal kind of businessmen on a, on a Thursday night kicking on from lunch. Mm-hmm. So yep. it's certainly changed things. But I think that given the the tough times that people are having in the industry, you can't open without some sort of guaranteed um, number of people coming through the door, yeah. basically. Yeah. And if people are going to book and not turn up, that's kind of a it's like a knife in the heart of the yeah. restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, we had um, a few weeks ago with a friend of mine who has the Rising Sun Workshop mm-hmm. in, in Newtown. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they were talking about they now have a ticketed system mm. um, and they were talking about how it's enabled them to make sure they've got enough staff on. Yeah. They're buying you know, all the, the correct amount of produce, it's it's um, made wastage a lot less yeah. um, and it's actually quite an efficient kind of operating model now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of places around town have reduced their menus as well, trying yeah. to sort of hone in on, on their levels of stock and their wastage and all that sort of thing. It's kind of a different approach to the same problem. Yeah. Mm. Because we can't afford to be throwing stuff away at yeah. the moment. Yeah. I mean, Bistec is a different story. We've got one main course. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like... Oh, we've got too much steak, or mm. we don't have enough steak. We just have steak. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but for a lot of other places that had much larger menus, you know, you'll notice they're they're really trimming them back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even some of the share plates, um, that people aren't really doing that kind of stuff here. Big, no. big, big cuts of meat. You know, where you normally you normally share it. Some of the places are closing down on that too. Um, if you do actually have wastage on your T-bone, just let me know and we'll we'll swing yeah, by. Definitely. <laughs> um, no, that's our record. Come on. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So. But you are a sommelier. Mm-hmm. What is a sommelier? Good question. Um, in my view, a sommelier is somebody who looks after the drinks at a restaurant mm-hmm. and that goes from beers to whiskies to spirits, um, any Amaro or bitters, uh, but clearly focusing on wine. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, you can – there are various qualifications, there are various methods of arriving at that job, mm-hmm. but essentially that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And okay. you know, it's um, it's an interesting job, you know. Mm. Wine is a, an amazing thing. It's always changing, so you're never going to know everything there is to know. Mm-hmm. And so it sort of it, it keeps it really interesting and, and you're dealing with people as well. That's yep. the other part of being a sommelier that's very important. You need to know how to deal with people. Yeah, so okay. what made you want to take that on as a career? <clears throat> I'd been working in restaurants for oh, 10 or 15 years, mm-hmm. I'd say, Um. And was working as a restaurant manager and, you know, I sort of figured out that the reason I enjoyed working in restaurants in the first place was dealing with people, you mm-hmm. know. Um, every day is different. You meet lots of lots of interesting and lots of different people and it's fun. Mm. 
as a manager, you're not doing that. You know, you're dealing with chefs, you're dealing with complaints about a steak mm. or, you know, somebody who doesn't like the table that they've been given. But if you're serving people wine, mm. people are always happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought to myself, mm, that is very true. <laughs> I'm not enjoying this. Um, at the time I was working for a big company and I sort of put my hand up and said, look, I'm willing to try something different. And they, they gave me a chance. They, they put me on the restaurant floor as a sommelier and I had to kind of find my feet. So you're a big wine lover as well? Oh, You'd yeah. have to be, yeah. I've, I've always loved wine. We grew mm. up with wine in the family. You know, Dad loved a big red. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we had little glasses of wine when I was, you know, 10 yeah. years old at the dinner table and it was all very special. Yeah. So, you know, wine is something I'd always been very familiar with. Um, being a sommelier though, you have to be familiar with a lot of wine. Yeah. And so that first six months in a restaurant, I think it had about um, 1,200 bottles on the wine list. It was a bit of a daunting time. Well, you drank all of – you went through all of those bottles. I – I would have loved to. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean like smashing all of those bottles. But I yeah, did smash a few on the way. Um, <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> well, you know, you've got to learn. 100%. Um, it was a, a really a big eye-opener mm-hmm. and there was a lot of study on my part, um, taking a lot of risks mm. uh, with advising people to drink something they weren't necessarily familiar with. Uh, a few failures, I yeah. have to say. Yeah. Um, but there's this little moment that happens when – you've been dealing with all these wines and tasting all of these wines as well. You know, every time you open a bottle of wine, you taste it, mm. um, where you kind of begin to see how it all fits in. Mm. And um, there's a way that Psalms look at wine. It's in terms of structure. It's not in terms of fruit or sweetness or anything, but you know, there are all of these different elements of a wine. So you can have two different wines from a very different part of the world, but they're quite similar in, in the way that they fit. Mm. Okay. So you can say to somebody, say, they come into my restaurant, which at the moment it's all Italian wine, I love Chablis. We don't have any Chablis. But I know that there are three or four wines on the list that are very similar to Chablis mm. uh, in terms of the way that they're built. We'll and come back to that because I want to know what a similar Italian wine is to Chablis. But okay. Okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's, it was a very challenging time but, but it was great. Yeah. You know. And and so it's a lot of it you mentioned about having qualifications. Mm. Is, that, uh, is that the Wesset stuff? Uh, Wes, it's one of them. Uh, there's another organisation called the Court of Master Sommeliers. Right. Uh, and they focus on primarily wine. Okay. Um, Wes, uh, they do spirits, they do beers, they do... Yeah. You, know, you can do a Wes diploma in sake if you want mm-hmm. to. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're the two main organisations for qualifications. Mm. And then I, I can imagine a lot of it's just learning on the job as well. I think that's the best way to do it personally. Yeah. Um, I think that... You know, if you're, if you're doing it as an interest, a Wesset course is a great place to start and get a bit of knowledge. But if you're not exposing yourself to these, uh, these wines in particular every day, it's going to be really hard for you uh, to advance. Mm. Um, and so the best place to be if you want to become like a, an advanced sommelier or, or get your Wesset Level 3 or diploma in it, is a restaurant that has a big, broad international wine list mm-hmm. because that way you can go, right, I need to brush up on Spain. I'm going to sell lots of Spanish wine today. Yeah. And it's like this sort of tasting board just at your disposal. Mm. Was there a wine in somewhere along your journey that completely sort of sparked and go, yeah, I need to pursue this? One particular wine? Uh, Look, I'd say um, maybe when I was about 25, I was working in a restaurant at the uh, Sydney Theatre Company and they had a Riesling from France and I'd never really, I'd never tasted a Riesling from France before. I wasn't a big fan of Riesling at the time either. I sort of thought, oh, it's all sweet muck, mm. which no, you know, nothing could be further from the truth. But yeah. I tasted this wine and it was like the lights coming on. Wow. It was just such a, a new sensory experience. I'd never tasted anything like it. I didn't even know how to describe it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. That's very true about wine. You know, you have that one glass, it's just like, you can't compare it to anything else. It's just flawless. Yeah. I'm thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a bit early, but I don't mind if you yeah. start. <laughs> Told and, you, John. Well, it's, it, I, I find that sometimes with music as well. I find that, 
you know, if you listen to a certain track, it can take you back to oh. where you first heard it, who you were with, how you felt. And I, I get that with wine and, and food too, because mm. I think it just, it smashes all your senses. You know, it's, it's like a sensory explosion. You know, you've got the taste, you've got, you know, the, the fruit, you've got the, the ambiance of the restaurant or yeah. who you're with. It's just everything. It's immersive, isn't it? Oh, it's in, insane, insane. And actually to your, to your point, around giving a customer you know a good bottle of wine yeah that's actually how we we connected at Besteca because right. we were with some friends who he doesn't drink wine and I'd said to Greg look up we kind of need a wine that's kind of nothing to it but, but a red and a you, bit like a pinot you said but not a pinot I yeah, think. yeah yeah and you you chose two fantastic bottles of wine um and he actually preferred the one that was a bit more fruity and a bit bit bigger I thought oh, nice. which was Sick. interesting so he just yeah. didn't know he just didn't know. He just didn't and know. that's the thing, you know, a lot of people don't know. You yeah. know, you ask them what they want to drink and they say, oh, I don't know, maybe a wine, uh, maybe like a red wine. And <laughs> and you you kind of have to play this game of, uh, of deduction with yeah. them to see yeah. just what it is they're after. Yeah. Yeah, a good song. They do ask the right questions because sometimes you do. You don't get a lot to work with. Mm. <laughs> yeah, what do you want to drink? Uh, a red? Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I like a Shiraz or a mm. Pinot and you think... They're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people don't know about wine. That's something that we as professionals have to deal with mm. every day. But you have to do it in a very uh, sympathetic way and make it approachable for them, mm -hmm. not intimidating. Yeah, there is a bit of snobbery to wine. There's isn't a there? huge amount of snobbery. There mm. are so many wankers working in wine. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> but, you know, a good song and, and there are quite a few good songs about um, will make that person mm. feel comfortable. Do you think these days people coming into restaurants, do you find that they're more educated with wine as well? Or maybe maybe they think they're a lot more educated? I think there are lots of people who like to show off in front of their mates. Yeah. Um, yeah, John's one. <laughs> ah, don't say that. <laughs> he was a perfect gentleman. Um, look, there are people who take an interest in wine and that's great. Um, there are a few people who actually know a lot about wine and they're generally very easy to serve because they open the wine list and they say, I want that one. Mm. And you go, sure. Yeah. And that's it. The difficult people are the people who think that they know a lot about wine but they don't mm. um, or they have an opinion about wine that is founded on, on some sort of falsehood or mm. misunderstanding yeah. and they're the people who can be quite challenging to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, when I just made a little crack about Riesling being sweet muck. It's not sweet muck. Mm. A lot of people think it is. And yeah. so if you're trying to convince somebody that an Aussie Riesling is is dry and mineral and crisp and fresh and the perfect thing to have with those, uh, I don't know, with that crab dish, they're, mm. they're just, they won't believe you. Yeah. yeah. And so that can be a challenge. Yeah. Mm. So, so going back to the, the snobbery in wine mm. and, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of the, 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 the fine dining and things, um, you obviously stand out, you know, with with your ink and stuff, yeah. and 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 how does that go in in the hospo industry? And you know, if you if you're at a restaurant and you've got perhaps a, a customer that's, you know. I, I think that my restaurant is a special case. You know, it it's not pretentious at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite earthy and rustic. Mm. Uh, we're encouraged to be cheeky. Yeah. You know, that's a part of what we want to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we also have a very esoteric wine list. It's all Italian mm -hmm. and 95% of the people who walk through that door don't have a clue what they're doing. Yep. Um, so I walk up, <laughs> they've been told to expect me. Yep. Um, Greg's a sommelier, he'll be with you shortly. Well, that, that's, that all sounds very nice. And then I turn up and smile at them and go, hi guys, how are you? Yeah. And they're like, oh, shit. Oh, we're waiting for Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Take my wallet, just don't yeah, hurt yeah, me. Exactly. Um, but I think it puts people at ease. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I look a little bit different to people uh, around me. Uh, people certainly remember me. But, you know, I'm polite and well-spoken mm. and and I said, what can I help you with this mm. evening? What, what are you looking for? Yeah. Like, oh, you're here to help with the wine list, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it can be daunting sometimes. It, it's incredibly intimidating, that document. You know, yeah. a, a lot of... A lot of wine lists are difficult, mm. but this one's particularly difficult because, you know, 95% of people don't know much about wine. Even fewer know anything about Italian wine. Mm. Yeah. And it's – they might say, oh, there's Barolo. Oh, Jesus, Barolo is really expensive. Mm. But at least I know what it is. And yeah. so they'll just order one to, yeah. to try to make it appear as though they know what they're doing. And that's not what they want. No. And then they leave unhappy. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's my job to – 
sort of take them by the hand and say everything's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and if you only want to spend 90 bucks on a bottle of wine, that's fine too. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to spend $2,000 by all means. But I'm there to, to bridge that gap between mm-hmm. what they know and, and what they want. So let's, let's touch on the price side of things as well. We're going to come back to your, to your tattoos as yeah. well. Let's touch on the price. Can you tell the difference? You know, if, you, if you're dropping mm. two grand on a bottle of wine, what was the one that you got really excited about in Italy, the, the, the Sas, Sassicaia. Sassicaia. And then what was the other one we tried the, in, that, in that Carve? And it was just as expensive. Uh, uh, Caviola. Yeah. I mean, that's expensive stuff. It was mm. can, 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 you, can you tell the difference? Yeah, does price define the quality? I think that price is a function of several things. Mm-hmm. It is a function of quality, definitely, mm-hmm. uh, because well-produced wine costs more to produce. It's more labour-intensive. Um, you have to crop the vines lower so the vines actually put more of their energy into every single grape. So you've got more sugar, you've got higher acidity, you've got greater flavour, and that's a labour-intensive process. You have to go through and, and, and prune half of your, your grapes off before you even harvest. Um, you have to harvest by hand, you have to press by hand, you know, it's a more labour-intensive process to make a quality wine. Um, price is also a function of scarcity. If there isn't very much of something, people will pay more for it. Mm-hmm. But it's also a function of prestige. And so if you have something that is well-known, um, people will buy it just off the name. So something like Penfolds Grange is a great example of that. There is no way that I'm going to pay for that wine. But a lot of people will because they go, oh, it's Grange, it's the best. That's what's happened to a lot of wines. Mm-hmm. You know? um, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Barolo now is so expensive, it's completely out of reach of the normal punter. Mm. Um, and that is, it's largely because of prestige, I'd say. But you certainly can notice quality in wine. I would say that though, if you get above the sort of 200 or $300 mark in a bottle, um, it gets to be a case of diminishing returns. So, you know, a two hundred dollar bottle is noticeably better than a one hundred dollar bottle. Mm-hmm. A four hundred dollar bottle, it's better than a two hundred dollar bottle. A thousand dollar bottle, you're splitting hairs. Pretty much, yeah. unless unless you have that level of expertise, where there's something you're looking for in that wine that's going to be in that. Uh, but for for the average drinker, I think that. Once you're spending more than about fifty bucks in a bottle shop, it, it doesn't make that much difference. Okay, good to know. So, who is your favourite producer of oh wine? God. I know um, that's a bit of a broad sort of question. I, oh Jesus, that's really tough. Mm. Um, I go through little romances with different yeah. wines. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm in love with Sicilian wines, okay. uh, and there are two producers there. One's called Cos, and the other one is Frank Cornelis, and they make. Uh, wines that are a little bit funky but not mm. not too funky um, but really nice, crisp, high acidity. A uh, lot of, lots of times use the word crunchy. I hate the word crunchy because mm. it's not crunchy. But, yeah. but that style of wine is quite herbaceous, very easy to drink in summer as well so they're quite light. Mm. Um, I really like um, – a couple of years ago I was really into Chablis. Uh, before that, German Rieslings um, – Keller Riesling was one of my favourite producers mm-hmm. for a while there. Uh, in Australia, I love Lakes Folly, Cab Sav and Chardonnay. Like Fantastic. Just good old-fashioned stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it changes week to week. Mm-hmm. Do you get to try stuff first? So we, we always try – so if, if you look at Bistecca in, in that back room, have you tried everything there? Look, I've tried a lot of it, to be honest with you. I haven't tried everything. Mm. Um, I've only been on the floor at Bistecca for about – Three months, I'd say. Mm. Uh, and I think there's about 500 wines on the list. So, you know, it's a lot to get through. But, yeah, definitely. But um, the way – if there's a wine – like what I did when I first went there, I thought, oh, I don't know any of these wines. Mm. This is, this is going to be fun. Um, every night before service I'd walk into the room and go, right, I want to try that one. I want to try that one. I want to try that one. Um, and I'd contrive to sell those bottles during the evening so I could have a little taste and mm. just find out. And, you know, most of the time what I sort of expected them to be was what they turned out to be. So it all worked out quite well. Yeah, nice. <laughs> you know, but, you know, you have to take risks. Yeah. Well, so – sorry, John. No, going off to you, Squire. Um, I'd love to know how do you – how does a som pair a wine to a, to a meal? There must be a lot of things you have to factor in or maybe there I isn't. Think, look, the most important thing is you have to give the customer something they want to drink. So mm-hmm. – 
they could be the most perfect pairing in the world. Mm. So something like, you know, there are classics like a consomme and a sherry, for example. But if the customer hates sherry, there's no point giving them a sherry with their consomme. They're going to mm-hmm. – it's not going to work for them. So the most important thing is if you have to find out what they like to drink or, more importantly, what they dislike. Mm-hmm. Then it's a matter of kind of matching matching body. So you don't want a really full-bodied wine with a light, delicate dish. If you've got a dish that has quite a bit of fat in it, you want a wine with a bit of acidity uh, just to balance. Uh, if you've got something that's quite savoury, you want a little touch of sweetness in the wine. Or, you know, if, the, if you've got spice or chilli, you definitely want a bit of sugar in the wine. Oh, pardon me. And it's just about finding that balance between mm. the two things. Okay. Is that why Is that why I remember my first kind of trip up to the Hunter Valley and they were doing Videllos and they were like, oh, guys, great with the curry. Great. So yeah. that, that kind of sweet, sweet and – Yeah, I mean, Vidello is – it's – Vidello is interesting because they make very dry wine out of it in Portugal but when we grow it here we tend to leave a bit of sugar in the mix. So it's it's kind of like a tropical fruity – uh, slightly sweet sort of wine. Mm. And, yeah, it's great with a curry. Mm. That's that's a perfect pairing. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned that you've been in the hospitality industry pretty much your whole your whole career? Yeah, I, I was one of those kids that went to uni at 18 and, um, and started working in a restaurant and then I dropped out of uni and I'm still working in restaurants. Yeah, okay. Um, why um, a lot of people in the hospitality industry, they like serving people. What, what have you seen that's changed and that kind of front of house side of things, you know, the the significance of the Somme or the you know the maitre d' and I think a lot of the formality has been blown away, mm. um, particularly at the top end. Um, I mean, first of all, there's very little at the top end anymore. You know, um, twenty years ago there were there was this like big group of fine dining restaurants mm. Mm. that's not around anymore. Mm. Um, a lot of that formality has been has been blown away um, by economics and by fashion as well. Um, I think that a lot more restaurants have increased their wine offerings, so they need to have a sommelier on the floor. Um, so for a restaurant like Bistecca, I think that, you know, five years ago there wouldn't have been one, but they would have had a, a short wine list mm. of, you know, maybe ten reds and, and ten whites. Yep. So it would have been quite easy. But because wine has become... Uh, a, a bigger part of, of the experience and a way to differentiate your mm. restaurant from other restaurants. Mm. Uh, having a SOM is very important. But overall I think the biggest thing is that, um, yeah, that formality has just been erased. Mm. You know, we're encouraged to be a bit cheeky. Mm. Um, we know a lot of our regulars by first name. Um, and it's almost a feeling of community in a way mm. Mm. with people who keep coming back and coming back again. Yeah. Does yeah. make it a lot easier, and then the night progresses a lot more smoothly when you got, you know, staff that are, you know, being a little bit cheeky and mm. being, you know, it sort of breaks that ice. And I find it, yeah, it's much needed these days. I hated the old fine dining shit. Oh, it's so it was getting too starchy. long in the tooth. Yeah, and you know, you want people to be comfortable and have fun. You yeah. don't want people to be sort of watching them as themselves so and going, rigid. Oh shit! Yeah. I used the wrong knife. Mm. You know. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's just awkward. Yeah, it is. And, and you could tell. Um, I mean, I've I've never really worked fine dining myself. Mm-hmm. I've been to a lot of fine dining restaurants, but you can just look around the room and scan and say, oh, that guy's really uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, he's brought his wife here for their 10th anniversary and yeah. he's shitting himself. <laughs> and there's no need. I mean, it's, it costs a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. Why be miserable when you're, when you're dropping more than you're going to spend on anything else that way? Yeah, yeah that's a good point. That's a good point. And I I find as well that because there's so much choice, yeah, the whole going out for dinner now is it's not just the food side of things. It is an experience. Mm. Yeah, you know? I think um, so. So, again, you know, going back to Bistec, you know, you're normally greeted by Mikey there who's great, great kind of front of house. You've got to put your phones away. Yeah. I love that thing, by the way, that we, you, oh, you lock your great. phones away. It, I think it's great. The first time I went to Bistec, I, I wasn't working for them at that stage and they took our phones away. My friend was appalled. He was absolutely affronted really? uh, and almost wanted to leave. And I said, no, just calm down. Separation just, anxiety. Put, put your phone in the, bu- in, in the box. It, it'll be fine. We did not touch our phones for the rest of the night. So we were in the room for, you know, two hours. Yeah. Had our steak, moved out to the bar. We were given our phones back. But we did not touch them for the rest of the night. Yeah. And it, it was great. It yeah. just completely changes the atmosphere of the place. Yeah. 
Well, I think the thing is where no one's and you know, look, I love to take a picture of the, the food and put on the odd socials, but no one's no one's checking in, no one's hashtagging the hell no. out of the T bone and you're just like, hey, can or we disconnected just, from the convo. Yeah, can we just yeah, can we yeah. can we I catch mean, up? The main <laughs> thing for me is the conversation. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we always say to people. Look, it's an experience, you've got two hours with each other. I would like to facilitate that conversation. Please give me your phones. Yeah. Uh, most people now either already know about it because their friends have told them or yeah. you know, they've heard about it or, or whatever. Or they, they just think, what a great idea. Just take it, mm. you know, smash it. Never give it back to me. I'm <laughs> sick of the damn thing. Um, there are people, I mean, there are exceptions. If you're a doctor on call or if you've got, you know, babysitters looking after your kids, sure, keep your phone on you. Of course, yeah. We understand that. Um, but it's taking it back to what it should be. It should mm. be a convivial, warm, um, shared experience. Yep. Not, not a contest, you yep. know. Um, so much of what phones get us to do now is be competitive with each other mm. and it's just not nice. That's fair. I've never looked at it that way but, yeah, you're right, yeah. That's a good point. Mm. Very good point. So what did you think you'd be doing if you weren't, if you weren't a SOM? I, I don't know. I've thought about this. Um, I think that, you know, some people when they're young they have a definite idea of what they want to be mm-hmm. and they pursue that with some kind of unerring ambition and and – then they become prime minister. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, there are some very driven people. I'm not like that. Yeah. Um, I'm interested by lots of different things. Yeah. You know, I like to read. I, I, did, I didn't finish my arts degree but I did an arts degree. Mm. Uh, in, you know, politics, history, English, French, um, you know, just sort of very generalist kind of things. I've got no idea what I'd be doing. Yeah. Um, most of the people I know who sort of – took my approach, they ended up working in the public service. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so um, I'd prefer to be doing what I'm doing, to be honest with you. Yeah. I have more fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's go, let's go to your tattoos. They must have hurt. That must have hurt. Yes. yes. Where, where did it start? Um, when I was 19, I got a little, um, a little tribal ankle thing <laughs> off a wall. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and that really hurt. I've still got that, by the way. Um, then when I was in my early 20s, I got my sleeves done. Yeah. Uh, in a very much kind of a tribal kind of way that was that was quite uh, quite fashionable at the time. Yeah. Uh, and then I sort of left it from the age of 25 to about about 38, I suppose. Um, but then I sort of worked it. I was getting towards 40 and I thought, oh, I've always wanted to have lots and lots of tattoos, you know. Even from a little boy, I was always fascinated by those people you'd see on a telly who were yeah. covered in head to toe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, fuck it, if I don't do it now, I'm not going to. Yeah. Um, and I'd been in Hawaii that week just by coincidence there was a tattoo convention across the street from the hotel I was staying in and there were all these guys walking around in their shorts, shorts and singlets just covered and I thought if I don't do it, I'm going to be really disappointed in myself. So, so I got back to Sydney. I made contact with a friend of mine whom I'd known for about 15 years who worked in the industry. He put me in touch with a guy that – was very much of the style I was after mm-hmm. uh, and we just started working from there, from the ankles up. Mm-hmm. Right, okay. So there is a theme to it? Um, I'd say that it's – I don't know about the word theme. I mean it's just abstract black, mm-hmm. uh, just shapes. Yeah. Um, there is an overall design that we started with. Um, that's been tweaked from time to time but it's it's definitely all, all of a type. Mm-hmm. Um, but for instance, I hadn't I hadn't intended to do my head or my hands um, because you know I was working in posh restaurants and mm. and you can't do that. Mm. Uh, but Benny, my my artist, he already knew what he wanted to do. Mm. Oh, so you let him drive? You let him? Oh yeah, I can't draw for shit. Right? Yeah, I'm <laughs> terrible. You know. So how long would that sort of big block take? Um, that's a pretty easy area to get tattooed. So yeah. that big block would have been about oh, three or four hours, I'd say. Really? It's a lot of colour. Just with a little break in, in the middle, yeah. like a half a So you do break. it in one piece, you do it in one session? Something like that, definitely, you yeah. can do in one session. Um, the head, though, that was five sessions Yeah, because it's quite a Pain? quite a tender area. Okay. So it, it depends where you're working. Um, generally the arms are pretty, not, not painless, but pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, legs as well. Anywhere that's got a bit of flesh is kind of yeah. um, you can put up with a little bit more punishment. Yeah. But anywhere that's close to bone or or in a ditch, like a 
like an elbow or an armpit or something, mm-hmm. um, that is quite painful. I can imagine your neck and the back of the neck would have been... Um, it's funny. Like most of these areas around here, around the sides, were actually okay. The Adam's apple was, was not very nice at all. Yeah. And then these sort of side bits where the muscles and the tendons link with, with the bottom of your skull, they, mm. they were quite tender as well. Yeah. But nothing compared to the side of my head, like above the sort of ear cavity there, that was just torture. That was unbelievable. Okay. And normally, like say if you're getting something done anywhere else on your body, you can distract yourself, mm. you, can, you can listen to music or you can have a chat or you can look at your phone or anything. <laughs> when it's here... It's it's just your whole reality for that moment. It's this, <laughs> there's this stinging pain. Um, it's causing bruising because it's against your bone as well. So there's that pain, and there's this buzzing that's just penetrating your skull. It is sounds excruciating. great. Oh mate, look when when I decided to get my head done, I started on the back here. And I thought, shit, what have I done? I'm gonna get it, <laughs> I'm gonna have to get it finished now. Yeah, I've gone too deep. It was just ah, oh, but. But, you know, I'm really happy with it. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. And that's all that matters, yeah. really. And I was going to say, so you mentioned about the, you know, getting it done and working the hospitality. What, what was the first day? So you got your head done. And then what was your first shift at work like? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the first shift after that, uh, I was actually working at the Gidley and I was doing the door because um, I'd hurt my ankle so I wasn't able to move very well. And all these people, I don't know, you've been to the Gidley, haven't yeah. you? But yeah. for people who haven't, you you have to press a buzzer and then the door opens and you walk down these stairs and then you're greeted by the person on the door. And, you know, normally you'd expect some 20-year-old girl mm. like dressed up nicely. Yeah. You know, welcome. And uh, they got me instead. <laughs> and so <laughs> I reckon. <G'day>. Yeah. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, a lot of people took a double take, to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, and they thought they'd probably come to the wrong place. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, most people, I mean, I think things have changed a lot over the last few yeah. years, uh, particularly, you know, barbers, bartenders. Um, there have been a lot of people like that walking around with visible tattooing for quite a number of years. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say there are too many Soms looking like me yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, you know, who You're knows? You're bringing it in. That's it. You know, yeah. someone's got to be first. Yeah, 100%. Um, but most people, I mean, once I open my mouth, people tend to be pretty comfortable. Yeah. Fair enough. Is there any noticeable sort of freakouts that you've seen that you've known noticed, like a noticeable reaction? Um, I see it must have been. People flinch sometimes. Yeah. You know, like <clears throat> I might sidle up to the table and say good evening, and they go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that happens actually a fair bit. I I don't really notice it that much yeah, anymore. Yeah. Oh, you don't play into it? I would um, play into that for sure. Well, it depends. Um, sometimes I'll start of an afternoon, say a Friday afternoon, and it's time to kick people out of the, the dining room and into the bar. Yeah. Uh, and I'll go over to the table and say, will there be anything else, gents? And they'll go, oh, no, we'll just get the bill. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, you'd use that for sure. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it comes in handy. Mm. But, you know, the main thing is that people tend to remember me. Yeah. And so you'll get somebody who, who will say, you served me a bottle of wine six months ago at the Gidley. Mm. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> I say, um. Yes. No. Mm, sometimes I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sometimes it, it's this weird kind of memory where you can say, I don't remember your name. I don't remember the occasion. I remember what you drank though. But I remember you sat at that table and you drank that wine and mm. that wine. Uh, it, it's quite odd. Yeah, right. So you mentioned before you were getting into Sicilian wines. I've noticed there's been – it's almost been a little bit fashionable recently because me, I'm Italian background, so I drink a lot of Italian wines by default. Um, but I've noticed – so I never, I really stuck away um, from Sicilian wines and then recently I started to go to a few restaurants where, mate, everyone's serving Sicilian wine at the moment. Look, is it – like wine, wine is, definitely has fashion sort oh, of – 100%. Wine yeah. is – Wine is dominated by fashion mm. to a large extent. Mm. Um, I'd say that Sicily is, is just about to start enjoying its moment in the sun, to be yeah. honest with you. Nice um, it's quite a sunny place. Yeah, it know? is. It is. Um, but the thing about Sicilian wine is, I mean, it's a pretty rustic wine industry yeah. in Sicily, you know. It's, um, <clears throat> it's only been the last 
20 years really mm. that any Sicilian wine has been exported. Mm. That's pretty much down to to one family, the Benanti family. Mm. Um, and uh, they come from the slopes of Mount Etna, mm-hmm. um, just outside of Catania. Um, they made their money in pharmaceuticals in the yeah. 80s. Um, I don't know how or why, but, you know, that's what What happened. was the family now? Uh, Benanti, B-N-A-N-T-I. Um, and they've got some cracking wines. Yeah. Uh, their Eva Bianco is, is just top-notch. Yeah. Um, very classic style, though. Like a lot of Sicilians make mm. quite funky wines. This is just straight down the line classic yeah. stuff. And it's easy to drink in hot days. It's perfect to drink in yeah, hot days. Because that's all they get, really. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's I mean, sort of, yeah. You've been there, it's yeah. it's it's hot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. But the wines are really clean and crisp. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they did was they made their money, they mm. went back to Sicily. Um, they had this land with these scraggly old vines on mm. it that had just been let to go uh, after the war. Yeah. Um, and just wondered if they could do something with it. And so they took it, they looked after them, they tended them, they had a background in pharmaceuticals so they tested them as well uh, to find out what the grapes were composed of and and what the breed was. Yep. Um, or sorry, you know, breed, that's not the word but I can't yeah. put my finger on it right now. Um, and worked out that they could make some quality wines with yep. what they had. Yep. Um, no need to import sort of international varietals. They, mm. they could improve on what they already had there and make something special. Yeah. So in Sicily, I'd imagine it would be very sort of traditional style of winemaking. Yeah. Sicilians seem to be very There's, traditional. Yeah, they're pretty set in their ways. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. When I was in Sicily um, July last year, mm. uh, I noticed a lot of people staring at me, to be honest, a yeah. few people making the sign of the cross as I walked past. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, friendly, friendly people. No, they did the um, same to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, very traditional winemaking there, and you know, to be fair, until recently, they were just making it for themselves. Yeah, um, I remember in Sicily, I had a lot of Malvasia. Have you ever had that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's quite can be quite floral. Yeah, can be quite quite a full on white wine. Mm. Um, there's a wine there that they make uh, called Grillo, which I really love. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a combination between a floral character and. And something really citrusy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing about a lot of Sicilian wine is because it gets all the all the breeze off the Mediterranean. Mm. You often find a, a little salty kind of yep. minerality to it, which it sort of keeps it refreshing. Mm-hmm. Like you just want to drink more and more and more. Oh, that's dangerous. Yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> so you see, you seem to have a real um, passion for Italian wine more than more than French, or, or uh, is it look, just that just because where you work? <clears throat> Tell I'm, the truth. I'm working a. Um, <laughs> I'm working with Italian wine at the moment yeah. um, and Italian wine is fascinating. Uh, I love French wine as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's probably where my first kind of real real love for wine came from was discovering French wine. But there's a lot more variety in Italian wine. You know, there's there are hundreds of grapes, literally mm. hundreds of grapes that mm. they grow in Italy. Yeah, uh, Some of them, they're only grown like the space of this flat would be the extent yeah. Of the vines of that particular grape in the world. Um, and that's fascinating. Yeah, you know? big time. Yeah, it, it's crazy. And you're always learning more. Um, I think the Italians are probably a bit more generous with their time than the French as well. Mm. So uh, when I was in Italy, every winery I went to, they were great. They they looked after us. They offered us food. They had a chat. You mm. know, it was really warm and welcoming. Yeah. Whereas, you know, in France, it wasn't quite like that. Mm. Big snobbery over there, right? Eh? Look, I think it's that just French. It's it, it's a different culture. Let's just say that <laughs> yeah. it's a different culture. Yeah. So you being a lover of Italian wines, what's your favourite region? Uh, I love Piemonte. Yeah, Lange for sure. Yep, yeah, for sure. I love Nebbiolo. Yeah, um, it's it's just such an expressive grape. I oh, love it. It's my favourite as well. Mm. I like the Friuli region as well. Like, uh, was it Scopentino by Bresson? Yeah, Scopentino. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting sort of. Yeah, and again, it's one of those yeah. things that you're never going to find anything like it anywhere No, else. I've never found anyone else that makes that wine. No. Yeah. It's very peppery and it was nice. Peppery and dark but still kind of elegant as well. Mm. You know, it's not – that's the other thing about Italian wines is they tend to be more medium-bodied. They mm-hmm. tend to be more earthy. Um, it's really dictated by where they are. It's not kind of – it's not a winemaker trying to produce a product. Mm. It's it's a farmer. Um bringing something from the earth, you know, it, it's a different approach. 
So when people say new world versus old world, what do they mean by that in terms of wine? Is it the way the wine's made? I think it's old world wines, so European wines. Mm -hmm. um, They tend to, uh, as a broad rule, they tend to be more earthy, more Mm -hmm. mineral. Um, They, if you like, uh, express where they're from. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that sounds like a wanky thing to say. Mm -hmm. but The terroir. Yeah, exactly. Um, But the thing is that the grapes that are grown in old world growing regions, that's where the grapes are from. So, of course, they're perfectly adapted Mm -hmm. to that place and that's why they taste that way. Mm -hmm. That's why you get Pinot Noir in Burgundy. Um, that's why you get Nebbiolo and Piemonte. Mm-hmm. Um, it's where that variety uh, came to be. Yeah. Whereas in the new world, um, we are experimenting. Yeah. And most of the, the grapes in the, in the new world are French varieties. So, yeah, yeah Chardonnay, Cab, Sav, Shiraz. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much what we grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not so much an expression of tradi- tradition most most times. It's people trying to make a style mm-hmm. uh, in a new place. And, I mean, you can you can generalise about the characteristics of new world wine versus old, old world wine. New world wine tends to be more fruit forward, tends to have a bit more alcohol. Um, it tends to... Uh, ..tends to have a bit more oak or, mm-hmm. you know, more winemaking techniques mm. employed to try to create... A particular style of wine, uh, whereas traditional old world wine is not that at all. It's the opposite approach. Just mm. let it play the play its exactly. course. Exactly. You know, this is what we have here, and this is what we make. So, in saying that, do you think better wine is made these days? Look, I think that we have so many more techniques at our disposal mm. um, to make sure that the wine that we're producing uh, is without fault. Mm-hmm. You know, so that that's a double edged sword as well. Yeah. I think that. Um, equality is a difficult concept to define in wine. I Mm -hmm. think that, you know, you have well-made wine or you have wine that's not so well-made. But sometimes the wine that isn't so well-made can be more interesting. Yeah. You don't want everything to taste the same. Yeah, 100%. I agree. You know, it's almost those little idiosyncrasies of flaws of wine that makes you remember it and like it. But that would be that. Surely you'd have that in, in your industry, in the automotive industry, with cars. Like, yeah. So yeah. cars are very much like that. So classic cars, usually the ones that become future classics, are the ones that were shit to start out with. So a lot of cars that were not very popular or didn't sell really well in the future become massive collectibles. But again, even though they're coming off a factory line, they've still got their little their little nuances. No, not so much Japanese cars. Japanese cars are very sort of you know, mass produced cars are different. Like Ferraris and Maseratis, every single one is different. Every single one. But I, I'm, I'm sure you'll find that in McLaren and anyone, any of that sort of ultra high luxury bespoke stuff that's handmade. On the, handmade means issues, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it's handmade, think, it means there's, you know, there's room for error. Yeah, exactly. I think champagne's a really good analogy mm-hmm. for that. So yeah. you've got prestige champagne houses mm-hmm. um, that make an excellent product year in, year out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a non-vintage product, so they... They draw upon several vintages Mm -hmm. uh, in order to create their house style. Um, And they're eminently drinkable and they're never faulty. And to my mind, they're not particularly interesting wines. But, you know, the quality is – it's high quality product Mm. um, from the big houses. But then you've got the little bespoke places, if you like, the the grower champagne makers. And they might put out two or three wines every year from that year and they're all different. And they've all got their quirks and some of them are, to my palate, delicious. Some of them, no. <laughs> um, it's not my cup of tea. But that's the interesting side of it. Yeah. You know, we, wine, I think wine is testament to humanity's ability to complicate things. Mm-hmm. It's just, really, it's just grape juice. Yeah. <laughs> that's all it is. Just, yeah. just $2,000 yeah. grape juice. Yeah, exactly. But, that's you know, true. we've managed to make it into this huge complicated thing. Mm. Um, but that's what we makes do it, it well. interesting. <laughs> and, you know, that's what's interesting about people. Yeah, that's true. So before we move on from champagne, mm. uh, I've been asked by a friend of mine to ask, what would you think is the best sort of vintage for that region for champagnes? Or like notable vintages? Uh, look, I, I think that if you're looking at vintage champagne, um, oh, God, you're dropping a bit of money. I'd say 2006 was a very good year for champagne. Mm-hmm. I'd say 2009, avoid it like the plague. Um, good note. It's, 
Well, that's just my opinion. Um, I think that 2000, the warmer years in Northern Europe are not good for champagne because okay. what you need to make a good sparkling wine uh, is freshness and acidity in the grapes. Mm -hmm. And the warmer the vintage, the lower the acidity and the higher the sugar will be in the grapes. And it, it doesn't produce the style of champagne that I like to drink. Okay. Uh, it tends to be richer, breadier, toastier. I prefer the kind of racium or mineral mm -hmm. tight kind of um, really tart champagnes. Mm, That's yeah. my cup of tea. So as a rule, I'd say cooler vintages, particularly with the way the climate's going, mm -hmm. um, the cooler vintages are definitely the better ones. Same as Fisher Blee, which, you know, they're very close to, together. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've started to see a lot of um, pet gnats mm -hmm. out and about. What, what is what is that? So pet gnat, um, I'd say this is probably how sparkling wine started. Right. Um, the way that they make champagne, for example, you you ferment the wine, um, then you bottle it with a bit of extra yeast and a bit of a bit of sugar, and then you put a, a seal on it. Then you allow the secondary fermentation to to take place, and that's what produces the bubbles in the wine. Yeah. Um, and then you, by a complicated process, you extract the yeast, the dead yeast at the bottom, um, but you keep the bottles in there, uh, the bubbles rather in the bottle, um, and it, that's what produces the the lovely sparkling wine that we love. Mm -hmm. Pet Nat, um, it's when you bottle the wine before the fermentation is finished. So there's still a little bit of sugar in there. There's still a bit of active yeast uh, in the actual wine. Pardon me. Um, but then you seal it, the fermentation continues in the bottle and it produces the bubbles in there. But you've also got all the dead yeast. The wine itself maybe hasn't been clarified. Um you get some really, really lovely pet nat. It tends to be quite sort of creamy in character as well, I find. Yeah. Some of it a bit funky, a lot of it very cloudy. Yeah. But, mm. but I'd say that it's probably the way that sparkling wine first arose, you know. Mm. One of those things that happened by mistake. They, yeah. they bottled the wine a bit early, hadn't quite finished, and then when they opened it, it was fizzy. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's, Bizarre. it's making a, a fault into a feature. So you obviously get to travel around or you have travelled around a lot with, with wine. Do you uh, – we spoke about Europe. How about Australia? Do you get to, I guess, pre, pre-COVID, did you kind of visit the, the, the famous regions Look, of, I'm one of, of those, I'm one of those terrible people that loves to travel overseas but I don't really <laughs> go very far in Australia. <laughs> it, it's really embarrassing. I mean, I've been to the Hunter quite a few times. I've been out to Orange yep. uh, a few times as well but apart from that, um, I sort of saved my pennies to go overseas, which yeah. is which is terrible. That may change over the next uh, mm -hmm. the next year or so. so. You know, who knows what's going to happen? Um, but you know, I'd I'd love to go to the old winemaking areas in South Australia. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've heard that Margaret River is just beautiful. I've been down to Tasmania a couple of times actually, so yep. I've been to wineries down there. Yep. Um, and Victoria, when things improve, yeah, I'd love to go down there. But yep. but it is one of those things where you know you you work. 48 weeks in a restaurant, you get four weeks off and um, you say, right, I'm going to France mm. <laughs> or, or I'm going to South America or I'm, I'm going somewhere completely different where they mm -hmm. can't email me. Yeah. <laughs> so where, so let's assume lockdown finishes tomorrow, where are you going to go? You can go anywhere. I was actually meant to be in Germany uh, at the moment okay. um, if things hadn't gone the way they had. Uh, with my sister, so we were going to sort of drive through the Riesling producing region, regions of Germany, yeah, um, and drink all we could there. So I'd love to go there. Yeah, um, the first the first restaurant I was working in as a som had a, a very good German Riesling list, and I miss that. Mm. I miss those wines. Yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to do. Have you uh, are you a fan of the Riesling Freak? I've drunk four of the Riesling Freaks. Yeah. Um, mm. And yeah, I, I think it's great. I, I, I love Australian Riesling. It um, seems to have kind of had a bit of a resurgence. It's popular again. It's kind of cool again. Yeah, which is such a shame because I used to be able to get a really good bottle of Riesling for 10 bucks <laughs> at the bottle shop. <laughs> and now it's, you know, I think it's great. Um, and I know that, you know, Soms love Riesling because it's, again, it's such an expressive variety. It's like, like Nebbiolo or Pinot or something like that. It has acidity and it has sugar and it produces what we like to call tension between the two uh, in this wine where you've got, you know, both of these aspects fighting for your attention and you've got the, 
the the fruity sort of sugar, mm. which is delicious, and then you've got the acidity, which is just making you thirsty, and, and it's it's a great grape, and you know it can be made into so many different styles as well. It, yeah. It's just so expressive, and so um, particularly in Australia, Clare and Eden Valley Rieslings are uh, they're top notch. They, Fantastic. They don't make that style anywhere else in the world either. Yeah, it's it's. It's something that's genuinely ours. Mm. So what is, for people that perhaps aren't familiar with a, with a Clare Valley or Eden Valley Riesling, what is that style? Uh, it's a very dry wine most in most cases. Uh, it's, it's fragrant, it's citrusy, uh, lemons, limes. There's this delicious kind of, um, I'm going to sound like a wanker now, uh, wet stone kind of minerality. Is it crunchy? Um, well, <laughs> some of them are crunchy. Um, some of them have a lovely sort of green apple character as well or a red apple character. Uh, but most of all they're just refreshing and dry, uh, perfect with seafood or just perfect to drink on a sunny afternoon. Yep. I love them. Yep. And that, that differs from a German-style Riesling? You can get German Rieslings that are dry. Um, you can get German Rieslings that are the sweetest things in the world. Mm. It's the thing about German Riesling is that that's where Riesling is from, really. Mm. Um, they just make it in so many different ways, mm. and every little region has its own characteristics. Um, so, what we would call a Moselle or something that uh, it's a bastardization of, of the Mosel region, mm. um, and they make some of the driest zingy, racy kind of highly acidic Rieslings you're mm. ever going to find. Uh, but they're also highly aromatic um, and just delicate wines. Mm. They're just delicious. Nice, okay. So when you're not drinking wine, beer. what's your, your, into your beers? Beer, 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 reshes. I love my reshes. Reshes? Reshes. Yeah. So just basically a cleansing ale. Just Oh, look, there's nothing better after after a long day of drinking wine <laughs> at work. Um <laughs> You know, wine can become overwhelming on the palate. And, yeah. and, and if I just want to drink something after work, I'll reach for a beer. I love yeah. a beer. I mean, saying that, I, I love I love reshes, but, you know, I love um, – I'm a bit of a pale ale drinker. I like a, a, a Young Henry's Newtowner or a Grifter or, or you know, those sort of things. Yeah. I mean, I'm banging into my sours and milk stouts at the moment. Mm. I love a milk they're, stout. They're very dangerous to sours because they just kind of clear they clear yeah. your mouth so you drink more of it and then all of a sudden you're just like, oh. Oh, I've had six. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it escalated very, very quickly. Mm. So going back to uh, that tradition about how they make champagne and stuff like that, do you think that traditional sort of winemaking is getting eroded with the new style of winemaking that's coming in that's a lot more sort of – uh, sort of analytical and steel vats and moving away from wooden barrels and I think that there's room for both of them. Mm. Um, I think that the first thing is uh, we have to recognise a lot more people are drinking wine now than mm -hmm. ever before and so if we want people to have access to wine, you know, necessarily some of it's going to have to be commercially produced. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it's, there's just not going to be enough of it to go around. But I also think that you know, like a prestige car, like you were saying, there's mm. always going to be a market for that that handmade yep. kind of traditional product. And, you know, I think one – I think they help each other in a lot of ways as well. You know, the the steel vat chemistry kind of winemaking, it wouldn't exist without the traditional style. Yeah. But also I think that traditional winemakers have a lot to learn from those who, who approach it from that industrial perspective. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I think that there's there's room for them both. I certainly don't think it's dying out. I think maybe in the in the sixties and the seventies, when there was a, a a great enthusiasm for using pesticides and and fertilizers, particularly in France, uh, there was a bit of a danger point for that. But you know, since the eighties, most of the prestige winemakers in France won't actually tell you they're organic, but they've been using organic practice since you know about nineteen eighty five, uh, just because. It means they can produce a different product to those people around them. You know, if if everybody's using the same fertilizer on their grapes, they're all going to taste the same. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you if you have your grapes growing from what's in the soil around them, um, you'll produce a, a distinct product. Mm. This might be a bit controversial. Um, Go on. China's influence in uh, the market in terms of buying out, you know, prestige 
pretty much whole sort of vintages of like Chateau Margaux and all of that sort of stuff. Do you think that's sort of hindered or helped the wine market or the wine industry? Look, I personally, um, I don't view it as a good thing. I don't think it's a helpful development. Mm. I think that when anything becomes a commodity like that, and really it's become a tradable commodity, people Mm. buy up parcels of wine now. Uh, in order to sell them for a profit a few years later. You mm. know, it's it shouldn't be that. It should no. be a drink. That's not what the romance of wine is supposed to exactly. be about. Exactly. But, you know, it's the same thing that's happened with the housing market in Australia, for example. Mm. You know, housing used to be a public good or a necessity. Now it's a tradable commodity. And look at what's happened. It's it's crazy and it's beyond yeah. the reach of, of the ordinary person. Mm. I think that, you know, it's it's great for the for the, for the winemakers of Bordeaux. Yeah. Um, you know, they're killing it at the moment. Yeah, big time. But then when when the fashion moves on from them, what are they going to do? Yeah. You know? Um, uh, so do you think there is a an ex- life expectancy for this? I think this so. This craze? I think so for sure. Mm. It's a bubble, yeah. you know, and bubbles always burst. They do. Fair enough. Thanks for that answer. That was, good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> was that what you wanted to hear? Or? <laughs> no, I was just interested to know what your thoughts were on it because yeah, oh, look, it's definitely a thing at the moment. So. Look, there are certain prestige wine houses that um, they do charge ridiculous amounts of money. Mm. You know, I opened a bottle of wine a few weeks ago that was $2,900 and there's no way it's worth that. You know, um, In the past I've opened $5,000 bottles of Bordeaux. What does a $5,000 bottle of Bordeaux taste like? Very much like a... a Five hundred dollar bottle of Bordeaux, if I'm honest. If you um, heard it here first, but thirst. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> oh, thirsty, clearly. <laughs> Man, talking about Let's that riesling before, yeah. I was like, oh, I love riesling. Yeah. yeah. Look, I think that um, I think it makes a lot of people feel special to spend a lot of money, mm. um, and I think that if they want to spend that money, look, that's 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 up to them. Um, if you're cracking that bottle, you're definitely trying it, aren't you? Oh, yeah. What's well, my job? Yeah. You know? uh, Look, if Brilliant. <laughs> That's my job, man, of course. Yeah, of well, course I'm going to drink it. Primarily to make sure that the wine isn't faulty to yeah. get before it gets to the guest. <laughs> but, you know, there's an element of self-education there as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say stuff like this, but I think that in terms of the prestige wine market, a lot of it, the prices are inflated. You mm. know, it's not a value for money proposition, but that's not why these people are buying these wines. Mm. Um, they're buying these wines because they want a taste of that luxury. They want to touch that kind of level of perfection or attainment mm. or, you know, they're reliving a memory of when they were in this particular place mm. 20 years ago or, yeah. you know, they're, it's not a rational decision mm. to buy these wines. But, you know, that doesn't make it an invalid decision. Mm. With the wine list as well, I was reading that um, – yeah, you know, people don't tend to if if you won't you won't choose the the cheapest, you'll choose like the one the second cheapest. Yeah, the second cheapest. <laughs> so what are don't the, ever choose the second cheapest. It's so, got the highest profit margin on it on any given wine list. This is what I was reading. Hundred percent. So this so what what a lot of the um a lot of the big companies do is they'll, their reps will go in and they'll put the the second cheapest bottle and that's the one they turn over more of. Yep. All right. Absolutely. It's always got the highest because, profit margin, particularly if it's a short wine list. Second cheapest. People don't want to look cheap. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice on buying sort of vintage, like older vintage wines? Because, you know, with Langtons and all of that stuff, you know, you have access to be able to buy a lot of old sort of like back mm. vintages and it's always a risk. Yeah, it's always it's a risk. It's a major risk. Like where it's do a- you buy them from then? You, or that's it, you've got to go to a restaurant. Are they always stored correctly in restaurants as well? Look, I think it depends on your motivation. Mm. You know, if you – if you want to buy older wine because you like older wine, mm-hmm. then that's a risk that you're prepared to take. Mm-hmm. If you're buying it as an investment, I would suggest that you look elsewhere because it's an unreliable investment to make. Mm. Um, there are a couple of houses. Langton's is a good person to buy from. Um, there's an organisation called Wine Away mm. um, based out of Brisbane. They're also very good. They make sure that the wines, once they come into their possession, are sellered properly. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, before that, who knows? And... It, it's it's a risk, mm. you know. Wine is not a stable product. It evolves and it responds to its environment. And so um, if something has gone wrong in the past, mm. you can't insure against that. Yeah. Do you yeah. buy stuff for Langtons? Yeah, heaps. Yeah? Yeah, I get ripped off all the time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, no. No, actually I've been buying for them for like a long time. Yeah. Sometimes I win, 
sometimes I lose. But, you know, that's that's kind of life, isn't it? It's the risk of the game. Yeah. Um, question. So when – if someone doesn't like the wine – so I've always wondered this. Ah, right. And so you you pop the bottle and back – you know, it's, it's a cork as well, so you mm. pop that. And the person actually says, no, I don't like it. Yeah. So it's not even corked. They're like, actually, no, that, that's, I don't like it. Look, it depends. How does that work in a restaurant? Mm. So here is the way it's meant to go. Okay. First of all, corked wine should never – faulty wine should never reach the table because the Somme should taste it first. Yep. Sometimes it slips through the net, you know. Sometimes you're really busy – um, and you'll pour something and the, and the guest will go, oh, that's not quite right. And you're like, oh, Jesus, you're right. I'm so sorry. Um, I'll grab you another one or would you like to choose something different and you take it away. If a guest has chosen something based on my recommendation, um, I've asked them what they would like. They've described their taste to me. I've said, you should have this wine. Uh, and I pour it for them and they dislike it, then I will take it away. Because that's my recommendation. I've made a mistake. Either I've misinterpreted what they've had to say, or I've recommended an in- inappropriate bottle mm-hmm. to their taste. So that's that's kind of on me. Mm. Um, if a guest, however, just picks something uh, without having spoken to me, or goes against what I'm trying to say, uh, you know, I'll discourage people from from ordering a more expensive bottle that I think they won't like, uh, and go for something a bit more approachable. If I think that that's what they should do, but if they then go no, I'm going to get that one and they don't like it, that's too bad. Yeah. You know? That's fair enough. I've, I've done what I can. Mm. Um, that's how it should work. Uh, in practice, it doesn't always work like that, you yeah. know. Um, if there's a bottle of wine that somebody really dislikes, I'll take it away. Mm. It's, it's just, it's better. You know, you want people to leave with a smile on their face. Yeah, and you can drink it later. There is that. <laughs> <laughs> there is that one. But yeah. you know, we can we can sell it to somebody else. You know, if, if I've got a good regular in, um, we had a, a thing a couple of weeks ago where where a guest ordered a, a quite expensive bottle of Barolo, thinking it was going to be like a big Aussie Shiraz, and you know that's not what Barolo is. Mm-hmm. But so I want that one. I'm sure he didn't like it, so I took it away. I knew I had a, a an old regular coming in about an hour later, mm-hmm. who would kill to get a taste of that wine. Yeah. So I sold it to him at a knockdown price. Mm. Um, and got this first guest something that they actually enjoyed. Did you try the Barolo? Yeah, well, yes. Nice? I had a glass. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was delicious. Yeah, it was, I bet. Yeah, I it bet. was uh, 2011 Palo Scavino. It was amazing. Oh, Palo Scavino. Mm. Brilliant. What was, the one, what was the one that you got really excited about when we sat in the private dining room? Mate, who knows? I can't remember that. Yeah, it's too dark. I can't remember leaving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys been into the um, the private cellar yeah. like around the corner? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, yeah, that was lumpy. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think I'm still paying for that. <laughs> I got some frequent flyer points anyway. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, well, Greg, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much for, for coming you. in and having a chat. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Um, Thank you, guys. And and it was the it was the weirdest conversation I think I've had ever, ever had after dinner asking a man for his number in <laughs> in front of my wife. Um, but that thank- wasn't at all awkward. No, <laughs> <it's not. laughs> but thank you very much. Um, if you do go into Bistecca or the Gidley, say hello to Greg. Look after him. He will look after you um, in the same way that you did with me. Thank you for coming on Lifestyle Pirates. And uh, mate, we shall see you very soon. That's Cheers. a pleasure. Thanks again. Cheers. Salute.